uh, a series of messages on the subject of salvation. Salvation. Because we use this word in church, and I, I think some Christians don't understand fully what it means to be saved and how you can be saved and keep that salvation. And so the title of my message today is, is The Fruit of Salvation. The Fruit of Salvation. And I'd like to uh, mention that uh, I had some experience, not a lot, but I had some personal experience on farming. Because when I was a kid, I used to spend some months, uh, three to four months of summer, uh, my, my uh, grandmother had a farm, and th that farm was quite large, so th there were many uh, uh, animals, and they, they, they had cows and sheep and all sorts of things, and the uh, chicken and the quails. It, it, was, it was an interesting time, and uh, I, 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 I was used to wake up with the ducks and, uh, and all of these things, and, and I, I really enjoyed, I, I was a city person, but I enjoyed spending you know, those uh, months, uh, you know, seeing the, all that was going around. And uh, uh, particularly, I liked the fig tree. Fig tree was awesome. And there was a few uh, uh, cherry trees, and, uh, and uh, I don't know if you like cherries. Yes. Yeah. And I knew where the good one was. <laughs> because, uh, you know, when you plant a tree, you can, you can plant from the same seed, but depending where the tree is planted, you will have different results in terms of the fruit. So, uh, it, 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 even in a, in a big farm, if you plant a tree on a, on a, a, a close to a, the water, and the, if you plant a tree on a, close to the dump, you know, you'll have different results, depending on what kind of dump. But, um, it, you know, the, the fruit will be a reflection of the location of that tree. And uh, last week I, I mentioned that God wants us to be like uh, trees planted by the rivers of water in the Spirit. Why? Because He wants us to bear good fruit. Now, uh, the, the, the Christian fruit, it's not just what is visible to one another, but there, there's something invisible. You cannot see it, but God will see it. So there's all these things that sometimes you do Nobody else knows that you're doing those things, those prayers, and, and that's, that's fruit, and, and the Lord is seeing that fruit, because the Lord wants to see fruit in our lives. So, uh, I, I've noticed this difference between fruit regarding the location of, of the tree, and some of you might not know, but when I, when I went to uh, university, I, I studied uh, uh, three years, actually, I was thinking too, but I studied three years. Uh, to uh, become uh, an agronomist. So I, I know a little bit about farming, not that much. Don't go and see my backyard, it's not like John Hathaton's, which is fantastic, it's a fabulous uh, backyard. Uh, you know, I don't spend much time, you know, uh, in these days, you know, taking care of, uh, of vegetables or anything. But uh, I know exactly the, di the difference between planting a tree in an isolated place with no water, with no conditions, with rocks, and planting a tree in a pleasant place with water and, and taking care of that tree. So from the same seed, you can have uh, opposite kinds of fruit. You can have sour fruit and you can have sweet and, and, and tasteful fruit. So in our lives, it's also very important where we're planted. What is the foundation? Where do we have our roots? And, and it's uh, sad to see that many Christians, they have their roots on the wrong place. And they have a, dif a, 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 a different perspective of what it means to be, to be a Christian. And um, let me tell you that in Romans, the book of Romans, as Paul was uh, talking about uh, fruit and, and our roots, our spiritual roots, he said in Romans chapter 6 and verses uh, 22 and 23, it said, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves or servants of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And usually we read this uh, verse uh, 23, which is the second part of uh, what you're reading there, and we neglect to understand that salvation uh, produces a fruit, and the fruit we get is what we, will lead us to sanctification. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit 
to uh, help us to get rooted in sanctification. And uh, as, as God's children, we need to be saved first and know that sanctification happens after. So we come to God just as we are. And as we come to the Lord and we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, we know it's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. We can expect our lives to be transformed. Amen? Amen. And, and this happens naturally. So sanctification, it's a fruit, it's not a root. And, and what some people do, they uh, misunderstand this. They think, well, in order to be saved, uh, I need to abstain from taking drugs. I need to abstain from sin. In order, you know, if, I, if I'm going to be saved and going to church, I need to stop going to the club. I need to stop doing this. I need to stop that. And this is not what Christianity is all about. You don't need to stop anything. Listen to me. In order to be saved, you need to receive the free gift, which is eternal life in Christ Jesus. You need to repent. And today, let me tell you, I'm celebrating Saint Jean. But I'm not celebrating Saint Jean Baptiste Day as Quebec celebrates. I'm celebrating Saint Jean Baptiste by doing what John the Baptist was preaching. All right. So we need to understand that the world can pass you a message, and today they they say we're celebrating Saint John the Baptist. They're not celebrating anything. They're celebrating beer, booze, and party, because the message of, of John the Baptist was repent, turn away from your sins. So. We need to understand that sometimes the world talks about things and we have this idea and we don't understand really what's going on. So I want to encourage you to celebrate today John the Baptist by repenting from your life of sin and turning your life to God. But in order to be saved, you don't need to do anything. Jesus did it all. You need to decide, yes, to surrender your life to Him. And as Romans said, to become a slave of a master. Now your Lord is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you become servant of Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit will teach you and help you how to get rid of a lifestyle which is not pleasant to the Lord. And when we naturally follow Christ, then there's a fruit in our life. It's called sanctification. It's a fruit. It's not the root of our belief, it's a fruit. So we come to the Lord just as we are, and we're saved by grace, not by what we do. There's nothing you can do in order to be saved. You need, yes, in your heart to repent, and then you make Jesus Christ the Lord. And when He's the Lord, then He will be patient with you, He will teach you how to walk with Him, and little by little, you know, there's a, a new life, it's like a sprout. There's a new life that is being born. And eventually, if you plant it in the right place, you bear much fruit. So it's very important where we plant it. You know, uh, when, we, when we go to a church, we shouldn't choose a church because it's close to our house. We need to choose a church because we know the Lord wants us to be there. Now, let me uh, go a little further to the main passage that I would like to share with you, with you which is in John chapter 16. And starting on verse 7. I know it's a little bit uh, small over there, but if you have your binoculars, please use them now. John 16, 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is your advantage, for your advantage, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. So Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit to his disciples. And then on verse 8, he says about the Holy Spirit. And when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And we'll continue to read a little bit further. But let me stop here to give you an illustration of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will convict people about a, a, a certain thing. And... It's concerning sin. So that is the work of the Holy Spirit. That is not the work of the Christian church. 
to convict the world that they are sinners. And listen, there's a misunderstanding on this work also, and I would like to explain this to you. Let, let me share a story that I, I've read, and, uh, and I thought this was very interesting, that happened during World War II. There's this particular uh, battle that is going uh, on close to the coast of, of France, and uh, the United States and the, and the British, the Allies, had their uh, aircraft carriers patrolling a certain area uh, close to the coast of France, and they were being very careful, very cautious. The airplanes were, were going and, and coming before dawn, and they will uh, land on, the, on, on those uh, aircraft carriers. But in that particular day, they realized that the German fleet was advancing towards them. And they realized that they had way more power and that they were in trouble. And uh, so they, they sent a, a coded message to tell all the airplanes to return. And uh, so the airplanes that were patrolling uh, in, uh, in the European continent, they started to return to the aircraft carriers. But as the German fleet approached, the, 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 the general, the captain, the admiral of the fleet had to make a tough decision. He realized they were outnumbered and they were going to be just wiped uh, if they didn't do uh, something. So they decided to turn off all the lights. They did complete silence. And uh, they decided not to use any radio. And most of the airplanes landed, but many of those airplanes were still on their way because they got delayed with something. So what happened in that particular day is that the, the aircraft carriers were there, the fleet was there, but because the enemy was so close, the, the admiral had to spare the lives of thousands of people that were in those boats by doing complete silence. So, for their horror, when the, the airplanes started to arrive, they started to circle around, but they couldn't see, it was too dark, they couldn't see uh, where to land. And one by one, they started to come down and to just crash in, in the ocean. And many pilots lost their lives because they were not able to see those, those ships. Those, the, 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 all the vessels had the lights off. And they couldn't do anything. They were just there, just waiting, as one by one, those airplanes came down into the Atlantic Ocean. And as I was reading this, you know, I, I got some inspiration thinking about this. The Holy Spirit is here on earth right now. And He is light in this world. And the church is here right now. But a time will come, and it's coming soon when the Holy Spirit and the church will be removed from planet Earth. And people will not be able to find God. They will not be able to see the light. It will be a time of despair. It will be a time of a great tribulation where, where people will try to find God and they will not be able to because we will be removed by God from what's about to happen on planet Earth. The radio, so to speak, will be shut down and people will not be able to understand, to listen, to know where to find God. And we are privileged today because the Holy Spirit is still here. Jesus said, it is for your advantage that I go. Because if I don't go, people will not be able to find their way. They will be in, in darkness, in complete darkness. But you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. You are the, the light of the world. So we're here, church, to show the world how to find Jesus. And today, let me tell you, today is the day of salvation. The Bible says that the present day is the day of salvation. We still can see the light. We still can understand that God is here. We can still listen to sort of the radio call of the Holy Spirit. And the Heavenly Father is still calling people. But one day this dispensation of grace will be over. And people will have no chance, no way, no opportunity to be saved. To be saved. So there's something we can do. And uh, Christians do one of these two things. What we should start by doing is cooperating with the Holy Spirit. We, you're here called to cooperate. Tell the, tell the pers person next to you, cooperate. But some Christians do something which I call complicate. 
So you, you're either a person that cooperates with the Holy Spirit or a person that complicates the work of the Spirit. What do I mean by complicated? You, you know, one of the reasons why our message as a church is not reaching out to the population, it's because Christians complicate things. They, they do. They complicate. And we need to question ourselves. And I'd like to challenge you to think about your personal life and think, am I cooperating with the Holy Spirit or am I complicating the work of the Holy Spirit? Because each time we put our set of rules, we, we, we do our, our own thing, we, we put religion in front of people, we're complicating the work of the Holy Spirit. They find themselves in a maze. They don't know where to go. And when they listen about church or God or the Bible, it's too complicated. There are even some churches that say, don't read the Bible because it's too complicated. I was in that church. I was raised in a Roman Catholic church where I was told by priest after priest, don't read the Bible because it's too complicated for you. And I, I need to tell you, the Bible, it's not, it's, it's not a complicated book. It needs to be explained. And we need to know how to study the Bible. And we need to have the right doctrine. Now, the Holy Spirit, as we've read, it says in John 16, 8, when He comes, He will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in Me. Now, here's where some people do a huge mistake. And I remember when I started coming to church and I listened to a message and the preacher was saying, the Holy Spirit will reveal the sinner that he is a sinner. The Holy Spirit will reveal that you're living in the world of sin. And I remember I wasn't Christian at the time and I was sitting down and I listened to that message once and I said, I don't need God to show me that I'm a sinner. Come on, think about this. Do you think that a person that is at the bar all the time, getting drunk, you know, doing all sorts of sin, that he needs the Holy Spirit to reveal that he's a sinner? That's a, that's a terrible mistake. And as a church, we need to understand salvation. The word convict or elegy in the original, it means to convince with solid, compelling evidence. But the Holy Spirit is not convincing with solid, compelling evidence that people are, are just sinners. But look what, what, it, what it says. He will convict the world concerning sin and judgment. Verse 9, concerning sin because they do not believe in me. So what is the work of the Holy Spirit? The work of the Holy Spirit is to help people, to usher them to Jesus. To believe in Jesus. Not just uh, you know, to tell people to complicate things and to, and, and to tell all oh, the Holy Spirit will show you that you did all these bad things. It's like people think that God is keeping record and He will say one day, Marlon, you have lusted 355 times during your life and you've lied 1468. The Holy Spirit will not do these things. Of course, God knows that we're sinners. We're in this world. We have temptation. We have all sorts of things. There's only one that was tempted and never committed a sin. His name is Jesus. Amen. This is why He is our Savior. He was no ordinary man. He was the Son of God. And He came to this world, live among us. And He was tempted in all things like we are. He was tempted to drink. He was tempted to have lust. He was tempted in all these things. But he was able to keep his holiness because not only he was 100% man, but he was 100% God, God. He was holy. And as a holy man, he lived in this world and he never condemned sinners. He told them, God loves you. God has a different life for you. This is the message of the church. Then the work of the Holy Spirit, yes, is to bring solid, compelling evidence of who Jesus Christ is. And when you get rooted in Jesus Christ, then sanctification happens. Then you will not feel comfortable doing certain things. Because you will feel, well, I shouldn't be doing this. 
And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And as that happens, then there's a fruit coming, coming out in your life. And God is going to taste that fruit. And people around, are, are, around you are going to taste that fruit. If you're walking in sin, you don't need anyone to convince you that you're walking in sin. Come on. Come on, church. Do we need to complicate things? Oh, the Holy Spirit will reveal that prostitute that she's doing wrong. You don't need the Holy Spirit to reveal that. She knows it already. She knows it already. What the Holy Spirit does is to t tell that prostitute, that person, that sinner, you need Jesus. And that's the work of the church. Now in verse, let's continue in this uh, passage. In verse 9, as you see, the, Jesus said concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And let me tell you what can get you to hell. Let me tell you that sin, like lying, will not get you to hell. Robbing will not get you to hell. Murdering a person will not get you to hell. According to the teaching of Jesus, there's only one thing that will get you to hell. You know that God loves you? And that thing that will get you to hell is unbelief. Unbelief. If you don't believe in Jesus, listen, He's the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to God. People can tell you there's all sorts of ways. You know, you can uh, worship Mother Earth, you can do this, you can do that, you can uh, be a good person, be a Buddhist, be this, be that. As long as you're good, God is okay with you. No, He's not. Because you're presented with an opportunity of believing His Son. And you might tell me, what about a person that never heard about Jesus? Do you think our God is so small that He cannot reveal Himself to anyone He can? How big is your God? Today there's a, a great turmoil in, in Egypt. And we've seen how religious fanatics are trying to take control of that country. And there's a great turmoil. And in this turmoil, let me tell you that the church is flourishing. People are getting saved like never before. We're seeing people in Egypt, Muslims coming to the Lord, not by the dozens, but by the hundreds and by the thousands. It's what we call a revival. And statistics show clearly that in that revival that is going on right now in Egypt, 50% of the Muslims that are coming to Jesus came through a dream or a vision. Isn't that something? Nobody preached to them. God preached Himself. Revealing Himself through a dream or a vision. And they're coming to the Lord. And there's a lot more Christians in Egypt than in Canada. And when I say a lot more, it's a lot more. The percentage, it's, it's triple the percentage, percentage of Christians here in Canada. So don't tell me that God cannot reveal Himself. The idea that God needs you. It's a complication to the true gospel. Yes, God needs you to be in this world as the light of the world. But if you're not here, you think God is so small that He will not do His work because you're not doing yours? Do you believe that gospel, that the reason why we don't see revival and why we don't see people getting saved is because the church is not doing their role? God will do His will and His work regardless of you and me. And if that shocks you, I'm so sorry. But that's the reality. And you may ask, oh pastor, what about those pygmies in Africa and uh, those tribes that are lost in the Amazon jungle? You know, nobody goes there, so they don't know about Jesus. Do you think our God is so small that He cannot reveal Himself through things that are created? He can. Yes, He can. I have the great privilege of pastoring the Mohawk Church. And some of our brothers are here from, from the Mohawk Reserve. God bless you. And, uh, and now every month I'm also helping the church in, the church in Oka. So I'm preaching there every month and helping that church to, to move forward. And uh, it's part of, of what I do as, as ministry. 
And, and uh, as I study, you know, the Native American culture, I can see all the symbols of their gods, false gods, but I see our true God in all these symbols. In the great spirit, in the eagle, in all these things that we say, oh, that's folklore. It's not folklore. God revealed himself to the Native Americans without anyone having to preach here or without the Mormons coming here and preach the gospel. <laughs> And that may shock you, but God can reveal Himself. He doesn't need you, but He's counting on you. And this is what we need to understand. The work of the Holy Spirit is not to say, shame on you because you've lied and you cheated and you did these things. Because you're a drunk and a liar. Shame on you because you're doing this. The reason why you're drawn to the church is because the, the Holy Spirit wants to tell you that Jesus Christ is the Lord. That God loves you. That God has a fantastic, wonderful plan for you. And what you need to do is just surrender your life to Jesus. The aspects of your life, the, your situation. You know, there's no big sin that God cannot forgive. He can forgive your sins. So you come just as you are. And don't think, well, He will accept me if I stop doing these things. Go one step at a time. The first thing you need to do is believing in Jesus. And the Bible says about Jesus... In 1 John 2, 2, that He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You know, Jesus, when He was at the cross, He took upon Himself the sin of the whole world. This is why God is not upset with you. Think about it. God hates sin. But God placed all His wrath, all His anger upon Jesus when he was there at Calvary when he was at the cross God took upon his children his child his only child all his anger so if you think that God is upset with you that's the wrong doctrine that's the wrong gospel because God decided to place your sin upon Jesus and he was upset with Jesus Instead of being upset with you. Some people ask. Oh if God is real. Why doesn't he show up. Why does God allow wars. And all these things going on. And all this sin. Why does God allow. You know these the child rapists. And child molesters. Even in churches and all these things. Why does God allow this. People commit sin. By their own choice. Now the wrath of God is not placed upon that person because it was placed upon Jesus. This is why God is not destroying the world. It's because all His anger was placed 2,000 years ago over His Son. And the, the earth shook and trembled. And Jesus was there saying, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And He paid a heavy price. For your sins, the sins of everybody that already died, the sins of those that are already to be born, yet to be born. God decided to place all that wrath and anger upon Jesus. So the only thing you need to do is to believe in the work of His Son Jesus. And when you start believing, everything starts to make sense. Then you say, oh, ah, this is why God is not destroying the earth. This is why God is not punishing me. Listen, if that gospel was reality, when I was 16, I would have been hit, hit by, a, you know, by, by lightning because I was living a life of sin. But God was so merciful that He looked at me and He said, He's chosen. And even though He's committing these sins now, I know that in uh, seven or eight years, He will come to me. And God was merciful to me. He's merciful to you. The reason why people come to church and are attracted to the gospel, it's not because of the singing, the message, the church programs, but it's because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for you. He has His replacement, the Holy Spirit, here on earth to attract you to where the light is. And we are the light of the world. Now, uh, let me finish by reading a scripture that we all know in John uh, chapter 3 and verse uh, 16 and I know my time is up but give me some extra five minutes 
It says, for, for God so loved the world, sorry, let me go back. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes. If you don't believe in Jesus, you have an opportunity today. But let's continue, because the verse doesn't stop here. Let's continue our reading. It says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So the work of God is not to bring condemnation. And when it says about conviction, to convict sinners, it's to convict them that they need Jesus. Not to convict them because they are liars, and because they are adulterers, and they bla uh, they, uh, uh, they're blasphemous people. No. And look at verse 18. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So the only thing that sends you to hell, it's not because you've lied and you cheated and you did all these things. That's not what is sending you to hell. But what sends people to hell is the fact that they did not believe in Jesus. And that's not a new doctrine. That's the doctrine of the church and of the gospel. But if you have a different doctrine, you're just complicating things. If you tell people, oh, you need to stop doing drugs because God doesn't like that. You don't need to tell that to anyone. Instead of, say, of saying something stupid like that, why don't you say, you should give your life to Jesus. Because you're doing something wrong, God loves you anyways. But just surrender your life to Him and He will help you to overcome all the problems you have in your life. You see, that's a different approach. Instead of going around and saying, oh, look at the way you dress and the way you do and your tattoos and all these things. You know, God doesn't like that. You complicate it. Who are you to tell others what God likes and what God doesn't like? Who are you to dictate who God is? God said in His Word that people will go to hell if they do not believe in the name of His only Son. God sent His Son to this world, not to condemn the world, but that the world will be saved through Him. And your salvation doesn't depend on your works or on stopping a life of sin. Of course you need to do it. But the first thing, the first step, what we should preach as a church, you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Please don't complicate the message. Because one day, we will all be... Uh, present in a place this is just a picture I don't think it's going to be like this but I was going to I was trying to find the picture of a, a great white throne because the Bible says that one day we will all be in the presence of God and when we get there we will have to be accountable for what happened in our life and in the great white throne God is not going to say oh Sandra when you were 15 you lied 456 times to your mother. This is not my God. There's only one question. And only one thing you need to answer. And the question is, why did you reject Jesus? Because some people have all the opportunities and they keep rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and rejecting. It's not rejecting the church. That's not a sin. Rejecting the church is not a sin. Rejecting going to church is not a sin. Rejecting Jesus, it's the sin you'll have to answer for. The church is here just to show you the way. Pastors are here to teach you how to walk in that way. Church is here to reflect God's glory. And whenever a church decides to say, I am a slave of Jesus, I will do the work of Jesus. God, do your will in my life. Whenever we do this, then there's a fruit in our life. And that fruit is called sanctification. First, get rooted into Jesus. Get rooted in a good Bible preaching church. Get rooted in the Word of God. Start reading the Word. Start praying to the Lord. And about your sin, that's between you and God. You don't need to confess your sins to a priest or to any other person. And as a church, we need to think if we are cooperating with the Holy Spirit 
or if we are complicating the work of the Holy Spirit. Can you say cooperate? Cooperate. That's who we are. We are God's ambassadors. Paul said we're in this world to manifest the glory of God. We're ambassadors of the King. The Kingdom of God has come. And now we have chosen. I'm going to live under the banner of Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. He is my King. And people can say all sorts of things. That it's just God or it's just another thing. Don't use the name of Jesus. But God will require from every single person accountability. And you have the privilege and the opportunity to say yes to Jesus and to cooperate with Him. Now, finally, let me remind you that sanctification is a fruit of salvation and not a root of salvation. So if you still smoke, I have good news for you. You're going to have it. You're going faster than me, but you're going to have it. Are you following me? If you backslide from church and you're somewhere else because you're really not into church, but you still love the Lord, you're still saved. There's a problem though. Your fruit is going to be sour. There's fruit, but it's going to be a little bit sour. That's why also then as we walk with God, the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And the church is here to help you on the way. But sanctification, not being conformed to the world, it's not essential for salvation. It's not part of the deal. Listen, when, when you do a, a cake or something, you ladies and some men, you, you're doing the cake and you're putting the ingredients. Right? Yes. Try to put salt instead of sugar and you'll end up with something hard. I'm not saying you cannot put salt in a, in a cake. I'm just saying if you replace sugar with salt, it's going to be something hard because you've used the wrong ingredient. Are you following me? Salvation has to have the right ingredients. And the right ingredients are your heart and the heart of God. That's it. It's you and Him. There's, it's nothing to do about church, about what you should do or you shouldn't do. It's your heart and God's heart. God loves sinners. God hates religious people. How do I know this? Because I've read the New Testament. I've seen how Jesus Christ treated the religious fanatics. He was always in confrontation with them. He even called them names. He was angry at them. Why? Not because of who they were as people, as persons, but because they were complicating the work of God. And then he told the church a very simple message. He didn't say, go and preach the four spiritual laws. Go and preach this. No, he said, go and preach this simple message to all people. Whoever believes in me is saved. And whoever does not believe is condemned. One of these days I was trying to, to watch Chris, Chris Rock on TV. And every two words he says, he swears one. Or every three words. And he's so much swearing. So, that man, oh, his mouth is terrible. That's his job. Do you know he's a Christian? And he goes to church. He even tithes. He preaches the Word of God, but then he has kind of a double life because he shows up as this, this guy, you know, full of filth and all these things. God is working on him. That guy is saved. His fruit is not the best. <laughs> but hey, who am I to judge the fruit? 
God will. I might say, oh, I don't believe he's saved. Who are you to believe or disbelieve in salvation? That's not up to you. That's not up to us to, see, to say who's saved, who's not. We're here just to tell people, Jesus loves you. Some of you, you're going through trials, tribulations, difficulties. This is my last Bible verse, which is in the... Uh, 1st Timothy and verse uh, uh, chapter 3 or 2nd Timothy chapter 3 and uh, it says but understand this that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self lovers of money proud arrogant abusive disobedient to their parents ungrateful unholy heartless unappeasable slanderers without self-control brutal not loving God Christian Christian I added. <laughs> it's not there. But these are the kind of people we see at church. These are the kind of people that live at home with you. These are the kind of people that we see around in our generation. Look at the attributes. They're all there. But God is not saying these are times of doom. No, He's saying, understand, in the last days we'll have a difficulty. What is the, a difficulty? It's something that can be passed with a solution. That's the way I see it. And the solution for this kind of behavior is Jesus. Amen. It's not the church telling people, you know, you shouldn't hate your parents. You should be obedient to your parents. No, this is part of this generation. This is what's going on. And if you're doing some of this stuff, your fruit is sour. Sorry to tell you. And many Christians have sour fruit. But get rooted into the gospel. Get rooted into Jesus. And know this by this simple example. Let's say you have a 20 gallon container of gasoline. How many know this is dangerous? <laughs> Let's say you open the container. And after you open the container, you light a, a, a match. You're going to have something just like this. You're going to have a nice explosion. But on the other hand, put those 20 gallons of gasoline in this BMW and you'll be able to drive 300 miles and the explosions are, st all are still there, yet those explosions now are controlled. There's a difference. There's still explosions, but there's, there's staying power. And let me tell you that some people, they had an explosion in their lives because one day they gave their lives to Jesus. There was an explosion. There was an emotion. Something happened. But then the explosion is, is off and what you see is just destruction, desolation. So their lives stay the same. So many people that give their lives to Jesus, they have something happening, but their lives stay the same and there's no more problem. But there's the other ones that are more like this nice red BMW that use the flow of power that's coming from God. And they don't want to, the Holy Spirit just to save them. But they want to go all the way enjoying the comfort and the good things that God has for them. God's power can transform your life and yes, you can also get a BMW like that one. <laughs> That's your choice. And you can choose to be planted by the waters. Today is your day. Don't be fooled by religion and by complication that you need to do this. And now you need to do the Alpha course. And now you need to go to a cell group. And now you need to do this. And now you need to take this course. And now you need to do th that. And you, now you need to follow this strategy. And now you need to take this course that the church offers. No! You need to do one thing. Believe in Jesus. Let us all stand. And I'm going to give you the opportunity. Before you leave this place. To give your life to the Lord. And listen, maybe if you have come to church so many times. And it never clicked. That the message of the gospel, salvation, is about believing in Jesus. And you said, well, I received Jesus Christ as my Lord, but now I have these difficulties in my life. Know that in the last days there will be difficult times. 
There's all these kinds of things. And maybe you're one of these people that are doing this wrong behavior. God is not here to condemn you. He loves you. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. You just need to say, Jesus, I give you my life. 